So welcome everybody. Um, Mitchell, is it good to start? I think so. Okay, all good. Okay, and um, okay. Um, so welcome everyone. This is um, Machine Learning for Australia, um, Community of Practice. Um, we are co-led by ARDC and um, other um, increases like NCI, QCIF, um, POSI, and, and CSIRO. And um, in, uh, in today's talk, and, um, and, and this particular webinar is also um, co-led by Intersect and QCIF. And um, so in today's, uh, yes, we will, we will share the recordings at the end, yes. And in today's lecture, or today's talk, uh, is about a machine learning platform that, um, uh, that ARDC um, co uh, co-invested in and was developed and in partnership at uh, Monash and um, um, UQ, and as well as um, uh, by QCIF. So we, uh, I mean, we take pleasure in bringing you this um, important um, to, uh, talk, and uh, which will hopefully inform you about um, a very uh, useful asset for uh, machine learning and AI. Um, activities, okay, and um, so it also um, I would like to add a note that machine learning for Australia ML for AU community of practice is a co-led activity, and we welcome participation from you for all things uh, AI and machine learning in the research and research infrastructure structure sectors. Okay, with that, and today's um, talk would be led by Mitchell, and um, who is all set and ready to go. And so I will hand over to Mitchell, but before that, uh, let me also um, acknowledge the country that we stand and work and um, um, I mean, I work and live in. We acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet, we pay our respects to the elders past, present, and emerging. And uh, so over to Mitchell now. Hello there, okay. So, um, when we were creating this platform, we were thinking about what kinds of environments that people were working with. Um, one of the best things that people uh, have been doing is, is, is doing things like GPU back notebooks. Now, these are ideal because they create this interactive environment, which is great for data set exploration and development. Um, and a lot of tutorials take this for it, which makes them very user friendly. Um, this is great for iterating on your code because um, you can move, move through very quickly. Um, you can you can change your your function and, and just rerun it without having to rerun the entire script. It works great. However, this doesn't work great when you're dealing with lots of users, and the reason is when you're not actively running your code, the compute is sitting idle, and this is really inefficient. It also means. Therefore, that we can't serve as many uses at once, which leads to really long wait times. And so it might mean that in some, in some cases, there are a lot of clusters where you have GPUs which are not really being used by very much. Um, and at the same time, we have lots of users which are waiting in queue. And so they, the site stops, and that's not great. On the other end of the scale, we have job submission. And job submission is very efficient um, with, with hardware usage when it's done correctly, uh, which makes it very good for mature workloads. So once you've completed writing your script, you can then uh, submit and have it run for 24 hours or something. And then once your training is done, you can then have a look at your things and, and select the best model or do whatever you need to. This gives you access to however much compute you need because you can just reflect, uh, you can just re uh, request whatever you need. Um, and this makes them large and, and flexible. Um, 
the downside is you now have to wait in queue. And it's not as easy to get going because now you need to work with Slack. Um, it also means that you then have to refactor all of your work to, to scale the hardware because things that will work with a direct reservation won't necessarily work with a, with a queue. And it makes things difficult when you're trying to share things as well. Um, for example, a common, a common mode of failure that some people have when they're sharing um, code with other people, a batch script that works for one user won't necessarily work for, for another one just because of user permissions. And I'm sure a lot of you have experienced the pain of submitting a job script only to realize after you wait for three days that it just immediately crashes. And this is not great for, for developing your cook. So we wanted to create a middle ground. If you're a new researcher, having a requirement for a, a percentage of GPU utilization for your job is not ideal because you need the flexibility to request however much you need and, and iterate quickly. And so job submissions just don't work very well. Um, so we need to create something that will help you to do that while also serving as many users as we can. And so by we've combined together a whole bunch of stuff as us uh, to create what we're calling the machine learning new research platform, LERP. So the idea that we had is, what if we could have a notebook that can inter interactively submit to the queue? So to be clear, we didn't develop the software, but we are creating an environment that supports it very well. This sacrifices some of the responses, uh, responsiveness that notebooks do have. Um, however, the, the upside is that it now gives us the ability to transition quickly between development and training back scripts because um, the, the code that you run within a notebook is very similar to what will then work on the batch script. And it means that it'll scale up quite easily because you can change the amount of, of compute that you need um, interactively. And because your, your notebook is submitting to the queue, you can then release that compute once you're done, which means that somebody else can use it while you're not. So while you are messing around with your function and trying to work out where the tab is missing, or why your for loop isn't behaving as expected, that's okay, because somebody else can be using the GPU. This lets us increase the uptime on the hardware and serve more users, which means that you then don't have to wait as long in queue. The way that we're doing this is we are using Dask. Now, Dask is not a requirement for using our platform. However, we do support Dask acceleration so that we can have this kind of interactivity. So the idea is that you will have a Jupyter notebook, which is CPU based, which will then reach out to Dask processes as required in order to use the GPU to run your, run your tests. And this is what this looks like in code. So at the top of your notebook, you will define the requirements of your Slurm cluster. Um, this is just a dust. Um, this is essentially a dust cluster, which is backed by Slurm jobs. Uh, you can see there using the job extra directives tag, you can specify that you want a GPU or not. You can also specify what size of GPU you want. And you, you can also specify things like how many CPUs you want and how much RAM which yes, means that at different stages in your notebook, you could be requesting different kinds of jobs, different numbers of jobs, different sizes of jobs. And then once you've written your function, you just submit it to the client like so. Uh, as you can see in the next couple cells, um, you just pass the function directly to the uh, DAS client and you can uh, return the result to the notebook. Uh, using the dot result function. So essentially what this means is you are running code remotely on another machine. And then after the job is complete, it will be returned to your notebook for you to then continue to process.
this does lead to some inefficiencies. However, we've run some tests and I was very pleased to see that the overhead associated with this decoupling actually isn't all that high. So as you increase the amount of training that you're doing for this test, um, we did we did this test using CFR. Um, as you can see, the, the difference between running it directly on a GPU with a reservation, which is what you can see uh, with local, and um, running it with a decoupled GPU, so running it on a dust job, which is the remote, it's very small, and the percentage decreases over time as you increase the number of ebooks that you have in the function. So, yes, it's not as efficient. However, now that we have this, this kind of decoupling, there are all sorts of new things that you can now do. So this is the hardware that we have on the cluster. We have six nodes, um, each of which have two A100s with 40 gigabytes of VRAM. There are 52 VCBUs um, and a whole bunch of RAM. We also support NVMe, which you can write to directly. Um, so if you uh, are doing a long training job, you can you can copy your data into the NVMe and then have this uh, highly performance uh, hardware that you can you can write from, sorry, uh, read from. Um, and we have two partitions with different qualities of service, some of which are designed to support dust jobs, some of which are designed to support uh, GPU reservations, and some of which are designed for direct batch, uh, batch submission. You will also be given a, a quota. So you will have storage, um, of some amount. This is sized per the amount that you need. So if you if you have a use case which requires a whole bunch of storage for your data, just talk to us, we can give you more. That's OK. Uh, by default, you will be given 50 gigabytes. Um, but as I said, you can have more than that. Just let us know how much you need. We also support group provisions, um, in which case you will be given a smaller amount for your individual uh, files, but you'll also have a shared directory where you can all write to. And so you can share things like models and code. Uh, currently, we have 10 terabytes available for users on the cluster, but we also have an additional 30 terabytes, which is coming very soon. The cluster is split into two partitions. Housecats is where we expect most users to start first. This is notebooks backed by GPU reservations. So this is going to be very similar to doing your work on Google Colab, where you have a GPU directly attached to your notebook. This is fantastic for data exploration. If you don't really know what you're doing yet, um, it's great for visualization. Um, it's also great if you just want to get started, because you can usually just take a notebook that has been written for any other compute platform, and it will just run. It's like having a GPU workstation. However, the larger sizes of GPU are locked behind the big cat partition. And so we expect that users will start on the house cats. And then once they get used to the platform, they'll move over when they need the bigger hardware. On big cats, uh, we expect users to be using CPU notebooks and then reach out to Dask whenever they need to use GPU processing. We also support direct batch submission on, on the big cats partition. And this is great for uh, data processing or um, rapid iteration during your development. And you can experiment with new techniques very easily now because of this, the, de uh, the decoupling that we were talking about earlier. Batch submission is also very good for uh, your model training and for hyperparameter suites, whatever you need it to do. You'll be noticing in the bottom left where there are these links. Those are the links to our documentation. So if you have a look at these slides afterwards, you can look in more detail for all of what we have um, in, in more depth. These are the limitations that we have on each of the qualities of service. So in the house cats partition, we have the tabby quality of service. 
um, this is 12 hour interactive GPU reservation type jobs. The idea is because it's intended for uh, active development, um, you don't really need a GPU while you're sleeping. So that's why it has the 12 hour all time on it. And that's also why there's only one job at a time. If you need to be doing something else, uh, like training, for example, that's okay. That's what the big cats partition is for. So you could, for example, have a, uh, a batch training run uh, running um, on the lion quality of service and then continue to develop on the tabby quality of service. And that's fine. Um, on, on lion, you have up to four jobs and we have 24 hours of all time. We're still being a little bit restrictive. We're not allowing the big seven day jobs. Um, and that's not because we don't expect models to want to train for more than 24 hours. It's that clearing out seven days of training time is, is really awkward sometimes. If you need to do training for more than 24 hours, that's okay. Just checkpoint your code, right? If you don't know what that means, talk to us. We'll help you do it. We also have some tutorials which you can have a look at. We also have the cheetah quality of service, which is designed for uh, fast, small wall time jobs. And this is this is ideal for your dark task workers. That's why we have uh, 20 jobs here. So if you, for example, wanted to spin up uh, a whole bunch of jobs so that you could uh, rapidly pre-process your entire data set, this is the quality of service for you. Lastly, um, I want to mention that we want to support those kinds of long, long jobs uh, for CPU only. We don't have it set up just yet, um, but it is coming soon. And we're gonna call it the, the, the Panther quality of service. Um, and so you're gonna have seven days with a small CPU interactive notebook. So the idea being you can, you can kick it off at the beginning of the week um, and then you can use your, your uh, dask jobs as required. And you so you could be running a long experiment over the course of your week uh, that is managed by this this long job. Um, and then just just train as as there is availability on the cluster. It also means that you then won't have to reload your entire data set into RAM every time that you look at each day. We understand that there's a lot of different options here. We hope that we hope that everyone will be able to find a quality of service that works for them as they start. We didn't want to put up barriers and force people into doing things in the most efficient way possible, even though that isn't as great for the hardware. We want to meet the users where they're at. If you're not sure where to start, talk to us. If this doesn't work for you, and you have some use case that I haven't mentioned, still talk to us because maybe we can work something out and then maybe there'll be a new quality of service for everyone. We're happy to work with users in order to create new features for the service. The hardware that we have is sliced up using multi-instance GPU. So NVIDIA calls this MIG. Um, this is the diagram that uh, NVIDIA uses to explain what's going on. The notation is not the clearest, but essentially um, the hardware is sliced up into seven different compute fractions, and you can split that up into these chunks of GPUs. We have everything from the 10 gigabyte size up in our cluster, which means you can request what is essentially an entire A100, A if that's what you want, a 7G 40 gigabyte uh, GPU, or you can request a smaller chunk, chunk like the, the 3G20. Um, in the tabby quality of service, only the 10 gigabyte slices are available. This is what this looks like in practice. Um, so 
in the Haskatz partition, we have two GPUs and they're sliced up so that we make as many 10 GPUs, uh, 10 VRAM GPUs available as possible. And on the larger ones, um, we have three nodes um, devoted towards a, a, a 120 and 210 split. And we have two, uh, uh, one node, which is two entire A100s, which are just not split up at all. So you can you can request the entire GPU if that's what you need. So the implications of this is that you now have the flexibility to write code with lazy ex execution, um, and things can be asynchronous. So the idea, what that what that means is, if you're not familiar with that, is that you can you can write things in a more optimized way. For example, you don't have to wait until your evaluation loop finishes before starting your next training run. You can just start that up in a new job, right? You can also now request different compute for different cells. So at the beginning of your notebook, um, you could have lots of small CPU jobs to do your pre-processing, um, spin up a new job for every sample, for example. Um, you could um, use a job with lots of memory in order to load in a big data frame, um, and parallelize it for efficient workloads. Um, and then you can use a GPU back process when you're testing your training runs. The trade-off is that the code is a little bit more complicated. We understand this, and so we've written tutorials for you. More on that later. We also still offer traditional alternatives, which means that you don't have to start here. You can start off using a direct GPU reservation and then move on when you need to. This also results in some new fail states. To our knowledge, this hasn't happened yet because we don't have enough users on the cluster for it to be a problem, but we're watching it. So we know that this will eventually become a problem and we will need to tune it so that it works for the most people. Um, we need to have more users using the system in this way for us to test this through. And so we hope that you'll bear with us as this happens. The Strudel run, uh, the, the, the cluster runs using Strudel 2 as the, as the interface. So the idea is you'll, you'll log in, and then you'll be able to select from a variety of apps. You don't have to use, this cluster doesn't require you to use SSH, though we do support that. You can access your JupyterLab instance directly from your, uh, from your browser. As you can see on the left, you can select from whichever apps you'd like. Um, for example, you could select this terminal app, um, which will launch with however much compute you need. You can specify how many CPUs you want baked into it. You can specify how much RAM you want baked into it. You can select how much time you need for your for your terminal to run. Um, you can also just run directly on the login node, though this isn't ideal if you're doing anything compute heavy. If you're just managing files, that's perfect. If you're trying to install a Conda environment, Conda is pretty RAM heavy, so select a whole bunch of RAM. And as you can see, uh, if you if you do something on the housecats petition, you will have a uh, you can get a, two, a, a terminal which just has a GPU reserved to it. Um, this isn't an SSH connection, as I said before. You can see this from the web browser. This is our JupyterLab app. Um, we have made it so that you can select whichever Conda environment you'd like. It doesn't have to be from our managed Conda environments. We've created some for you to start with. We call it the Data Science Kitchen Sink, DSKS. Um, it has a whole bunch of really common data science packages, machine learning packages. This is where we expect most users to start. It's not where we expect users to finish. Because of course, if you're writing your own code, you want to be able to control your Python packages. Something that you'll notice about the struck down is that they're not all from the same uh, Conda installation. <laughs> you, 
the the service will pick up anything else that you um, you install on the system, and so you can you can launch uh, and and point the app towards anything that you install across the cluster, and you can just manage your own system in user space. And of course, this is the Jupyter Lab uh, UI. Again, you can do this from the web browser. For authentication, we use uh, SSH certificates. This is all abstracted away from you if you're using the web terminal, oh, sorry, the, the web browser. However, you can also just directly request a certificate from us um, using single sign-on. We have an app for that. Um, so you can uh, log in through AAF. Um, we also support Google if you have external collaborators and you want to do a, um, uh, a group allocation. Um, but as I said, we also have a tool, which means that you can get a certificate that will let you SSH indirectly to the cluster so you can manage your uh, files. You can also SSH indirectly to a job um, it doesn't have to just be on the login node. Uh, we've, we've also worked out a way for you to do that. Um, this is how Strudel works on the back end. Um, essentially, the idea is you will be using the front end. Um, you, you'll, you'll sign in, you'll select what you want. The SSO provider will give us a thumbs up or thumbs down and tell, you who you, tell us who you are. Um, and then we will a provision a certificate that either will be downloaded if you're using the tool or will be stored in your browser so that you can then interface with the cluster. If you don't understand what all this means, don't worry about it. Just use the web browser and it'll be fine. And I recorded this, this GIF of uh, the user flow. Um, I hope this helps to cement everything together and make things clearer. So as you can see, um, you can select from whichever compute region you have an allocation for, um, and then just launch it up. Uh, this then lets you run whatever you need to in the browser. Um, when you're ready, you just clean up the job, close it. And you can also do the same with the Jupyter Lab. I hope that the streaming is actually going okay, and this is in the slideshow for you guys. <laughs> okay, it, it's now looped. Um, so I'm gonna move on. You can also connect in uh, once you have an SSH certificate through the VS Code Remote Explorer. Um, again, you can also do it by connecting to a job. So you can be using your Python debugger inside of a, of a job that's attached to an A100. Um, we do support this. <laughs> there are a few gotchas. So if you're going to attempt this, have a look at our documentation first because um, there, there, it can lead to some unexpected behavior with, with batch submission if you follow VS Code's instructions. Um, so just, just double check what you're doing before you, you, you blindly try and do this. However, it is a fantastic way to, way to work. All of our documentation is program, uh, programmatically generated. It's publicly available from GitHub. We encourage you to clone a copy. We encourage pull requests. Um, there are tutorials up there, which means, um, it also means that because the tutorials are run on the service, and because the code is generated from the cluster, um, we can be pretty confident that things will work for you if you just clone it. Um, of course, there's going to be bugs. This is a beta service. But um, as, as you come across things, let us know, and we'll work with you to fix it so that we can make things better for the next users. They're just, they're just be quiet. 
please, please, please come tell us. We have some tutorials that have been written. Um, at the moment, we have been focusing on how to do things with Dask and Slurm, um, because we expect this to be the primary point of friction with the service. However, as users develop uh, more maturity on the platform, we want to try and, and expand this too. If you aren't sure how to do something, let us know. And as people, as we see commonalities and what people are struggling with, um, we will we will work with you guys in order to to create better documentation and better tutorials to to help people into the future. So the requirements for using this platform is just that you have to be doing some kind of machine learning. And one of your project members needs to be a researcher that's based in Australia and New Zealand. Beyond that, it's really quite open. So we would love to have more beta testers. We would love to have more people on the platform. If you are interested, then um, just let us know. It will not cost any of your plastic, any of your funding. What we do expect from you is that you report bugs, you help us to fill in the gaps in the documentation, and you give us your user feedback, because this helps us to improve the platform and therefore serve more users. We also expect that you help each other as a community. We do have a a community Slack channel, so you can reach out for help, and I'm always present uh, to to help people. Um, but as the the community grows, there is only one of me, unfortunately. Um, so if you guys can help each other, that would also be fantastic. Um, beyond that, we just expect that you be patient with us because we're a small team. If you would like to sign up, there is a QR code. There is also a link to a Google form. Um, that brings me to the end of my part of the presentation today. Are there any questions? Thank you. Thank you, Mitchell. Before we take any questions, maybe uh, let's pause the questions for a little bit, but this is a fantastic presentation and uh, thank you for taking us through. And uh, let us also see if Oliver would want to talk about any upcoming um, uh, plans for training. And then, um, then we will take the questions for both together, if that's okay with you. No worries. Well, I might as well just do my section of the talk and we'll okay. take um, questions at the end of all that, if that's all right. That's good. Sure. Yeah. Unless people want to ask questions now, like um, let's not, um, well, they're still fresh. So so you want to defer your um, talk, uh, your part of the talk till the end, is it? Well, well if there's questions now, you, you might as well, you know, start. Yeah, if, the, if there are any popping questions, it's okay. Yeah. Otherwise, let's finish the talk. I don't see any questions on the chat. Okay, the question that I, I have is any plan for training? That is a good segue into the next part, Oliver. Um, there are plans, um, but they're, they're very fresh plans. I'll, yes. I'll touch on that at the end of my at the end of my section. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And uh, so you want to jump into US now? Um, sure. Okay, so um, I'm a research analyst at um, UQ, and um, I've been working uh, in collaboration with uh, Monash for some time now. Um, I was with this um, uh, project that gave birth to um, Emily um, last year. Um, my focus is slightly different. I've been um, looking at... Um, uh, optimizing uh, very large data sets um, used basically to train um, neural nets. And um, so I've come at this from the um, HPC cluster side of things, where we want to put uh, multiple GPUs together 
um, to churn through data as fast as possible. Like some of the use cases that um, I've come across, uh, you know, we're looking at about uh, maybe three months of um, wall time um, just to see if it was possible um, to train some neural nets on one high-end GPU, um, which, you know, if you're a researcher trying to pu publish a paper, um, that's probably a, a no-go if you can burn that, that much time um, to work out if something's viable. So um, optimizing um, these processes for speed, um, if um, the resources can be allocated for it, because it normally means um, adding more GPs to the, to, um, to the fray, um, sometimes it is essential. Um, now, in, in that, um, you know, optimization and speeding up of um, training neural nets, um, you're always going to fall back on, uh, on profiling to see where things um, could be improved. And um, probably 80% of um, what I've uh, put together um, as far as profiling on um, HPC clusters is applicable everywhere. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm putting in, uh, I'm putting together um, simple workshops um, and um, reference material um, that should be applicable to um, a, a general set of users. Now, a lot of the users that, that I come across are maybe not um, machine learning experts or computer science experts per se, um, but, you know, that, that they, they'll have um, expertise in, in a domain. Um, and typically what you'll do is, is you'll copy code from elsewhere and try and run it on our um, HPC. Um, you might be adapting code um, because you're, you're, the type of data you're dealing with is, um, is very close to um, what other people are doing. And um, a bit of profiling um, and looking at how efficiently it, it, it runs um, can be a great service um, work when you're having uh, problems. Um, and uh, also when they scale up um, uh, from toy data sets to um, what's going to be a, a production data set, um, you can also run into to brick walls. Um, on the um, large end of it, where we are getting, um, you know, teaming up multiple GPUs, um, I, I'd call those users more expert users. You know, they're going to have to have pretty um, uh, detailed knowledge about how their models work and how, um, you know, clusters are, are, are tied together. Um, they're going to probably know more about um, their particular, you know, um, area of machine learning than what I would. So um, for those users, I'm, I'm basically um, putting them in the right direction um, with regard to how to make, you know, the, the, the bytes flow through a machine uh, quickly. I'm more of a plumber than, um, you know, telling them how uh, to implement their particular um, machine learning uh, code. And uh, finally, we got like uh, our system administrators. Um, they want to ensure that um, you know the libraries, Open API, everything's configured properly, and that you know we're using um, hardware efficiently. Um, so, so they're the three types of users. Um, and my, my particular focus has been more on the general users, um, especially when with, with regard to uh, something like like Emlet. But um, if we go to the next slide. Um, I'll talk about the platforms. Um, so everyone, uh, you know, has got a, a laptop or a, a PC with some sort of GPU in it, um, and you can do quite a bit with small data sets. When you've um, got code together um, on your workstation, um, you might want to run on a, on a HPC node with a single GPU because that GPU is going to be a lot faster than you know what you'd have available on a workstation or a laptop. Um, also, you've got a lot of CPUs that you can use, and um, you know high performance um, disk. So, 
then you can move up to the multi-GPU, multi-node um, clusters. And finally, um, I'm going to address how um, the work that I've done can be deployed on this um, Jupyter and Dask architecture that uh, Mitchell covered. Um, a lot of it is going to be um, basically combining uh, what you do on a workstation or a single HPC um, node. And, and like I said earlier, um, probably 80% of what I've done is, is going to um, uh, cover that. So let's go to the next slide. I don't have control of the slide. Eh? Um, so the most simple case um, is basically the, um, the IO pipelines. Um, oh, I've got to say, when I say um, profiling uh, and optimization, I've got a very simplistic definition of it. Um, basically, you look at the total time amount of time your job runs and how much percentage of that time your GPU is sitting idle. If it's sitting idle for a long time, it means you know you have to look at um, what, what your code is doing. So we want to have high utilization of the GPU um, over the, the, the total time of the job. Um, so most of the bottlenecks are going to be in feeding um, data from disk and doing some pre-processing um, to make it ready to be fed into our models. Um, fortunately, to solve that, that issue, most of the framework, all of the frameworks have got um, nice profilers built into them. Um, you can just turn them on programmatically, run the code, um, get your hands on the profiling data, and it will just tell you um, your um, GPU is sitting idle because you've been waiting on um, IO. And then you might even have suggestions about what you can do to, to um, speed it up, which sometimes for, for users is just an oversight in the way they've um, either copied um, networks down or you know, naively put together um, um, their um, training code. And um, there would be simple suggestions um, given by um, these profiles as, as how they could do that. So this would be incorporated into, into a workshop, like, like um, make sure that um, you're streaming the data as efficiently into um, the GPUs as possible. Um, something that um, caught my interest with, with all the um, talk about Dask is that Dask can be used for staging data. Um, so, you know, there's potential there for uh, pre-staging data without tying up a GPU and then running the GPU code once all the data has been put in place. And that might involve um, some of the pre-processing that would be done in, in like a single shot job where your, um, your entire job is um, taken care of getting data, pre-processing it, feeding through the GPU. So it'd be interesting to, to um, break it down into um, a CPU only job um, leave the expensive GPU resources alone while you're doing that, and then bring those uh, GPU resources online once that once it's been done. Um, like honestly, just the um, I/O side of things, I think would be uh, at least seventy percent of what a novice user would be dealing with as far as um, uh, profiling and then optimization would be concerned, and it's quite easy to do. Um, on a uh, Jupyter environment, um, you know, you, you can turn off the profiling in the code to say, switch on profiling, give it a path to where you want to uh, put the data, and then after the, after the job team run, uh, pick it up and, and analyze it using the same GUI tools that you do for looking at um, how you're training um, for parameters are shifting it as, as you do a training run. Um, this, now, I, I have got a pretty simplistic view of it. Um, it's, it's necessary to be able to fit th this sort of um, you know content into into workshops. Um, so I'm not being glib. Um, the, the second thing I look at is is the memory footprint of of, of what's um, being done. Now I'm saying that I'm not being glib because I know there's a lot more to it than just this. But these are just um, two simple things that I'm I'm trying to cherry pick to say. Um, this is how we, you know, go forward in, in trying to optimize our um, ML codes. 
Um, but the memory footprint issue is when you um, either try and put in a data set that's too big for the um, intention of, of um, the code that you've downloaded, or um, you're not paying attention to how um, your data set will scale up and, and fill up a, a GPU, let's say you increase uh, a sample size. Um, and with the, the same profile as using as a, as a framework, you can have a look at um, how full your, um, your GPU is going with a single job. And um, you know, a lot of times it's just going to um, stop running and, and say that I'm out of memory. But um, quite often, um, well, occasionally, um, it'll run, but it'll run very slowly. Um, and there, um, the profiler will, will actually give you hints. It'll say, um, you know, you could cut down some of the um, data types and some of your layers, like you're using, um, you know, full floating point numbers, um, cut it down to um, FP16s and that, and, and it might help. Um, and also you could, you know, um, if you see that the, the memory footprint is, um, um, too big, you can move to a, a, a larger GPU. Um, the, the way that um, memory can be a bit problematic because of the way that um, uh, these pipelines behave. So this is sort of like just a guide as to um, um, it, it either fits or it doesn't fit. Um, I wouldn't be able to go in, 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 a, in a workshop environment um, too deeply into um, how to fix a problem past, okay, we can just change some, um, some memory types and see if that will run. Um, as long as the um, system, uh, you know, converges properly with, um, say, a reduced uh, memory type. Um, but basically it's a go, no go um, type of deal with, with the profiling. Um, you know, how close to the sun can we fly? Um, and when you crash into the sun, um, you need to have quite good knowledge um, to, to fix it. So if we go to the next slide, um, then we have the more complicated stuff, which is um, when we get uh, putting uh, multiple GPUs together um, to solve problems. Um, now what we're concerned with is how much time is being spent um, communicating from one GPU to another. Um, to do that, you're using a new set of profilers. Um, uh, sometimes they, they are attached to new frameworks or um, supplied by vendors themselves because um, you, you, you don't get the information on how some of this inter-process communications is working. Um, and when you tune it, you have to actually go through and um, modify your code a little bit um, to change batch sizes um, and, and, and reshape things uh, to keep that inter-process communications down. And then you have to also monitor how your um, convergence is going, um, if, if your particular model is um, agreeable with having um, those parameters changed. Um, also, memory utilization comes into it depending on what sort of strategy you're using for, for multi-GPU stuff, um, whether you're using uh, parameter servers or um, ring reduce style things. So um, things get you know a little bit complicated. Um, also, because you're in a multi-GPU um, uh, context, you're generally dealing with a lot of data and, and that generates a, a hell of a lot of profiling data. So here we have to um, focus on subsampling the data, like um, taking slices of profiles where um, uh, you think you're, 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 you're focusing on, on performance because um, you just can't handle that much data that's being spat out by profilers on multiple um, nodes and then combining them and, and, and trying to make sense of it. So you have to take um, little um, sections of, of code or um, run it on one node and try and extrapolate what's happening in others. So it becomes like a logistical um, um, game. Um, and finally with that, um, something that, that probably only is relevant to sysadmins is um, having a close look at, you know, how drivers and hardware and operating systems are um, interacting with each other. Um, 
I've only been there, you know, a couple of times in in, in two years to, um, you know, make sure that you know some specific NCSL calls were being used on our, you know, generation of, of GPUs. Um, it wouldn't be something that, that the uh, general user would use. Um, if we go to the next slide. Um, So um, there's going to be various tools, um, the easy ones, like 80% um, uh, tools to, to, to solve these problems are the ones that are typically bundled in with your, with your framework, whether you're using TensorFlow, PyTorch, um, or whatnot. Um, they have nice GUI interfaces, and they also give you like a little list of um, what you can try uh, to make things run efficiently. Um, when you... Um, that would solve the, the data IO issues. When you're looking at things like um, trying to tune memory, um, you need to combine um, the um, data from the profiling tools with um, the data that's being spat out um, by your training ones, like to, to more of a convergence and, and what's happening in your model. Um, so, so that needs to be covered, is that, um, when it, when you go past just um, straight I/O, you have to look at um, uh, you know is your optimization actually affecting um, how the um, uh, model is performing itself. So that but again um, here we're we're using data that typically comes out of the same um, framework, so it's not difficult to to, to marry up. Um, and then when you move into um, you know the, the multi GPU um, side of things. It's a little bit more difficult because you've got to marry up, um, you know, data from different types of profilers, and um, you have to have a, you know, a bit bit of knowledge about what's going on in the hood to um, to bring it all together. Um, and, and you know, different cases need need different um, um, uh, remedies, I suppose. Um, but one thing, one thing with the multi GPU stuff is, is, in most cases, if you've taken care of the I/O and, and, and the memory. Um, it can kind of just work, and if it if it if it works, you know you're getting you're getting a speed up, um, and that's good enough. You don't you don't need to profile it, um, and when it doesn't, it's usually because the model itself isn't going to support um, what you're doing um, to the hyperparameters to 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 ensure that it runs on a on a um, GPU. So um, it's not really. Um, like it, it would be used in maybe, I don't know, 10, 20 percent of the cases where, where you're doing uh, multi GPU work and there are problems. Um, typically, you'd solve them with the, with the easier stuff first. Um, okay, if we go to the next slide. So, yeah, generalized approaches is just look at um, your um, GPU utilization over the total runtime, which is easy to do. Um, uh, if you're using, um, uh, you know, um, like uh, say DAS to distribute data or um, you're using um, HPC type, um, you know, clustered file systems, um you need to be aware of um the lead time of getting um data available like we've got a hierarchical data system um so you just got to be aware that the profiling is being done when the data has been put in place um and to discount that from um well to, to be aware that that's not a part of um, um what's being addressed here um the, the other um, approach is with the, with the memory. Um, again, I, I mentioned this. It's, it's either a, um, you can get the, the memory to, to um, get the utilization to be as close to um, maximizing a GPU. And when it gets more than that, then you're going to need um, um, quite a good knowledge of, of what's going on under the hood. Um, so it's like, you know, how, how close to the sun do we want to fly? Um, and with the multi GPU stuff, you're you're basically looking at um, how much inter um, GPU communications is, is is going on. Um, if we go to the next slide, 
Um, okay, with respect to the MLERP environment, um, again, um, the, the profiling, um, the easy stuff um, can simply be done from within your Jupyter Notebook environment. You just got to know um, where to place the data, where, where to pick it up, and how to feed it through, you know, the GUI tools um, to, uh, after the run. Um, Again, I've said to, I'm only really looking at the, the GPU utilization. So I'm not looking at um, how much time is being spent, you know, staging data. Um, and I haven't um, spent any time looking at profiling, um, say, Dask itself, um, although there are um, options for profiling Dask. Um, so how I'm seeing Dask is, is basically a service to um, stage the data and kick off um, like a single GPU job, even though DAS can actually perform distributed um, uh, GPU operations itself. Um, and I, like, I'm pretty interested in, in what happens there, um, given that you can split the um, um, data staging and the GPU processes in DAS. So I think that would be very useful. Um, I think I've come to the end of um, my spiel. Uh, but what I'll say is that um, I've put some workshops together for the multi-GPU stuff. And I'm going to do the same thing for profiling. Um, and I'm going to cover the simple cases. And what I want to do is um, allow a user that isn't, say, a machine learning expert to know when they're going into an area where um, things are problematic. So they just keep keep on pushing um, aimlessly. And um, that would be um, when you're coming to, when you're bumping into um, when memory utilization is, is, is going overboard and what to look out for, um, you know, how to um, work out how your data scales in a, in a, in a model, um, how, you think about fitting that into 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 a GPU, and that if you go over that uh, that waterline, um, then um, things get quite complicated. So it's it's, it's a way of saying um, we'll put some guide rails down. Um, the first of all is, is is the IO. That's an easy one. It's straightforward. And then after that, it's like how far can you push it until you know you, you really need to get to know what you're doing or where, where you need to go for um, outside help if you're not an expert user. So there's going to be um, workshops um, targeting that and also um, reference material as well. So that would list, you know, how to get um, the various profilers going on, on your particular framework, um, the, the, the plumbing of, you know, moving data around and, and, and analysing it. And I think that would be quite good um, because then you get, you know, more efficient use of, of the resources and, um, you know, some of the machine learning um, um, efforts could be more um, tractable, I think. Um, so that's what I'm doing. Thank, th thank you, Oliver. That was good. And um, uh, yeah, so um, it uh, actually you have delivered more than uh, just an introduction to upcoming know, training. You have delivered um, the training more itself. Like Fifteen minutes, then. <laughs> that's wonderful. No, no problem. That, that is fine. And uh, so this is good. We have a couple of questions. We don't have a lot, but um, which is good uh, in the sense, uh, so you have filled the time, but is there any plan to pre-test code before uh, running it either on CAT to make sure it will execute without errors? I mean, I think someone is looking for a test environment. Um, so, so we expect that you should be able to just test things directly on the platform. So you can request a CPU-only job if you're not ready for a GPU, and that's perfectly fine. Um, Dask has an option uh, called the local cluster. So rather than running it on a different machine, you're still writing Dask code, but it's but it's running locally, which means that you can test things without having network dependencies be a problem. Um, you can also just directly run the Python function um, to test that everything's working first. So what I would suggest is the way to go. You would start by just writing your Python function, run it directly in the notebook in a CPU environment. Then when you're ready to scale up to Dask, you can test things with a local cluster. 
and then finally move on to a slam cluster when you're ready to start using GPUs. Um, we do actually have a tutorial which covers uh, how to use local clusters and things for testing. Have a look at our documentation. Sure. Um, Mitchell, I have a question. Actually, it's Mitchell and Oliver. Yes. Um, could you outline what would be a prerequisite for a user? user of this platform? That, that's a hard one. Um, I've come across, um, uh, you know, quite a few types of users, um, say, you know, very good physicists, um, great knowledge of, um, you know, computational maths, but, um, you know, lacking in um, how to, you know, say, apply machine learning um, to, to um, some of the work they want to do. Um, but that they'd be able to get it eventually, right? Um, uh, so, all the way to um, you know, you know, machine learning gurus that that know a lot more about um, their area than say what I ever would. So, um, the users come from a very broad gamut. Okay, that suggests that what we're trying to do with the, with this platform, um, with making things available over the web browser, um, providing some amount of directory GPU reservations, we're trying to lower the barriers of entry. We want to make it so that if you're doing some kind of machine learning, even if you're a brand new, uh, if you're brand new to the field, that's okay. You can start with running things on house cats. Um, it's a very user-friendly environment. Um, we've provided you with condo environments so you don't have to, to battle through trying to create one yourself if you don't feel like it's ready. It may not have everything that you, you want to uh, starting out, but when, when you're ready to start installing your own packages, you can clone it and use that as a basis. Um, also, we're, we're able to help you if you are having trouble, don't just feel like you have to suffer in silence. Um, I would suggest that the only real prerequisite is that you're doing some kind of machine learning because that's who the platform is for. Excellent. Um, I don't think that you, you need to have that as a, I don't think that you need the knowledge of how to do the pre the, the machine learning as a prerequisite because we want to make this platform a place where you can learn that skill. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, I, I've seen it in um, in bioinformatics as well, where people were using you know machine learning for you know um, uh, Im image analysis and and uh, analyzing. Um, microscopy images and they certainly didn't need to know a lot of knowledge of, of machine learning um, to get you know really good use out of it um, something that I'll also point out if you are a new user and you find that there is a point of friction um, in the process let us know what that is and then if there's enough other people which have similar points of friction we will work with you to try and remove that from the system to give an example, we had a user a few months ago who found that our uh, pre-built environment just didn't work for them. And because they didn't really have very much experience in Bash, they didn't really know how to make their own environment either. Um, and the way that we used to have it set up, you had to um, uh, point Strudel um, to, to the environment that you set up using a JSON file in a specific place which was just not very user-friendly at all, which is why we came up with this new method of uh, reading the, the, the .conda slash environments.txt file that the conda maintains. So yes. now you just sort of get it automatically um, unless you do something funky with your installation. Um, so now you just select from the dropdown which environments that you want, and that should include user environments now. So we've now removed that point of friction. Um, I'm sure there are more points, but we won't know what those are unless you don't, unless you tell us. So that that is a great um, point to actually emphasize, and um, yeah. So um, so in in essence, um, please come and work with the platform, and as you as you learn and uh, as you actually see issues, please uh, let the team know, and uh, Mitchell, Oliver, and uh, several others are there to help you and um, there can be some uh, future courses that um, 
um, Oliver might deliver. There can be some. There uh, will definitely be um, some. Yes, uh, so Oliver will yeah. deliver. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, in uh, in the in next year, and uh, so keep us informed as what you need as well. So that would that would help, yeah. and also for Mitchell to um, tune the platform, upgrade it as as it um, as as it develops. Yeah. There is another. Um, Couple of questions. Um, one uh, from Lorenzo. Um, uh, it um, it, it says I just noticed the documentation is based on Quattro. Since I am since I am quite interested in Quattro, and I started to introduce my daily work routine. I would like to ask which is the typical process that you adopted and used to write, maintain, develop, deploy, and ML ERP docs with Quattro? It is a bit of a tangential question, but nonetheless, uh, Mitchell, you can uh, swing it away. Sure. Um, so Quattro, we deploy that using GitHub pages. Um, it's something that Quattro just um, just supports out of the box. So the the workflow is that you, you make whatever changes you need to locally. Um, we have an installation of quarter on the cluster. So um, this is where I'm using the, the VS Code remote server feature. Um, so I'm I'm SSH'd in using my VS Code. I, I write whatever changes I need to. Um, I run preview. Um, the, the extension then shows me the rendering of the docs. When I'm happy with it, I then run the command to push it onto GitHub pages. And um, it it just it just pushes up to the GitHub pages place. Um, the URL um, we changed using um, a Nectar URL. Um, it's just a, it's just a DNS entry that we created. Um, in theory, you could CI/CD this so that you don't have to run the command. I've just been lazy about it. Um, yeah, um, we. As I said before, we do encourage people to uh, make their own copies of, of the repository and, and create uh, pull requests. So you should also be able to do that. Um, in our documentation, we point out where the installation of Quarto is, and we tell you how to make the adjustments to your VS Code extension um, to point to it. So if that's something that you want to do, uh, have a look at that page. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Um... So there is another question about changing the language. Uh, Robin is asking whether MATLAB could run on, um, or could be made to run on on this. Sure. No um, licensing issues. <laughs> yes. So I don't current. I don't. We don't currently have any plans for MATLAB. Um, one of the big problems with MATLAB is licensing because. Unlike Python, you need to have a certain number of licenses in order to run MATLAB code. Yeah. Um, that being said, though, that doesn't mean that it's, it isn't something that we couldn't try to support. Um, we have been having some discussions about R, for example, because even if R isn't the best language for machine learning, maybe researchers would want to preprocess the data sets in it. Um, we don't know a good way to isolate R environments, though, yet. So that's something that we need to talk to users about. Um, also, with the, the MATLAB is, is Octave. Um... Viable. Yes, that's the other thing I was thinking. Rather than MATLAB, maybe it's Octave that we'd support. Octave. Yeah, um, right. right. For a start, anyway, because uh, MATLAB licensing is is Expensive. probably need to hire a yes. staff member just to do the licensing. Yes, that that. And Rachel asks whether there are any alternative to Jupyter Notebook. Uh, sure. Um, so. Uh, if you connect directly in with your VS Code um, or any other IDE for that matter, I know someone tried to do it with PyCharm once. Um, it is something that you can technically do, um, but uh, like you, you could you could just run the code as a script directly inside of a terminal. Um, do you do that? Um, you could also uh, use VS Code's notebooks rather than having to use JupyterLab. Um, if you can name a way of running Python code, you can probably find a way to do it on the web. If I haven't mentioned it and you're not sure what that would look like, let me know um, and we'll work with you. 
Okay, and uh, I think that answer is, is uh, satisfies Rachel. Kanan asked if he could install Mallet and use Python. I don't know what Mallet is, so I can't answer this neither. question. Actually, neither do I. So, <laughs> what I will so. say is that if you can install it in user space, there's nothing stopping you from running. Um, asterisk. If you think it's something that more than one user could use, then once you work out how to install it, let us know, and we can make it available for more people. That's that's good. That that that's good to know. So, um, um, okay, he says it is Java based. Okay. And, um, I I've never tried to run anything Java based on the cluster, but if it can run in Linux, there's no particular reason why it couldn't. True. Okay. Um, so whether this platform ex exclusively caters to Python is another uh, question from Rabia, or if it extends to functionalities to other programming languages such as C++ and Java. So that's- We've been uh, focusing on Python just because that's where we think a lot of researchers are trying to, to start with for their machine learning code. It's not that we don't want to support other languages in the long term. So like I said before with MATLAB, we don't currently have plans for other things, but that doesn't mean that that can't change if there's a sufficient user demand. What would you be using uh, C++ for directly? Yeah. Write kernels, maybe? Well, um, I mean, most, be, most of my C++ wrapped Python functions anyway. Um, yes, <laughs> but, but I also know researchers which directly write the machine learning code in, in C. Right. So yeah, I mean you can you can write directly in um, the TensorFlow C++ hmm. against the API, but um, yeah, it seems pretty um, hardcore. Actually, I might just switch back to the other question slide that we have since there is a QR code on it. Yes. So there is a QR code and uh, please uh, sign up. And some people have asked about Slack channel. And um, you cannot join the Slack channel directly. And uh, I stand corrected on that. You have to join the um, platform and or in the process or join uh, or send an email to um, mlerphelp ML at gmail.com. And um, so with that, I think that's that. Um, Okay, uh, Pauline is giving you what Mallet is about. There is a GitHub page for us to um, understand what this is. It looks like some members in the community appears to use it. That's so, that's a, so it's it's good to know. And um, so if there are no other questions, this is really a wonderful session. You have, um, it's, a, it's a very complex topic and uh, um, and, and that, but you have made it accessible to, I, 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 I take it, vast majority of the users. And we want more people to come to the platform and use it. And uh, this, uh, this, this would be a good way for, uh, I mean, uh, further augmenting uh, machine learning in the Australian research community. Look, I've been on the, the side of the MLA, um project for, you know, much more than a year now. I think it's going in a good place. I I think there's some good decisions there. Um, yeah, it's good. Sure. Um, and then making the, the, the mission of making the Jupyter Notebooks available to users in common is, is a very good one. Um, sure. it, it solves a lot of problems. So, and uh, absolutely. And also, uh, please join Machine Learning um, um, for AM Australia Community of Practice, ML for AU COP. And um, so we will actually feature more of these uh, developments in this community. And, um, and also, I hope the community that develops, or at least a sub-community that develops, might be directed towards this ML ERP. And um, and its usage, so we would be um, uh, so very happy for you to um, um, join there in in your invitation. It it should be there, and um, I will put a link.
here I'm, uh, let me post the link for you for ml or au there it is Okay, it is called by a number of organizations and in, including um, ARDC. And uh, we welcome participation from the research and uh, research infrastructure sector. And uh, before I close, I would like to uh, in, um, tell you about the last webinar as well as, um, uh, um, as well as, um, um, the the one that are upcoming. We have um, three more upcoming webinars that uh, we are um, um, uh, we we would be co-presenting, and um, so uh, let me post that. And the slides for this one and the last web webinar um, would be uh, posted uh, soon. So. So they, they, they would be made available to you. All the, everyone who signed up, they will receive the slides and the recordings for this webinar, as well as the one for the last one, which happened last week. So there is one every, uh, there is one next week on the fifth, and then another one on the seventh. Um, that have been proposed. There could be another one in either later in December or early January or in after mid January. So with that, uh, let's um, show our appreciation for Mitchell and Oliver for taking us through. Thank you so much. Uh, great work done. And um, and and then um, until we see you see you for the next event.